graduates in political science, and uh, I worked in campaigns since I was nine years old. Um, I was walking through the house at the age of seven, and on the TV was Jesse Jackson doing a Hellfire and Brimstone speech at uh, the, at 1988 Democratic National Convention, and I stopped what I was doing, sat in the floor, watched it, and at the end of it, I looked at my mom and said, I want to do that someday. And she looked at me and said, are you sure? And I said, yes. Now, this is coming from a kid that had to take speech for seven and a half years because you couldn't understand me when I talked. So she had to ask me twice, and Miss Lucretia Beasy, who is uh, my speech teacher in Henry County, I'm from Paris, Tennessee, originally, is one of the most influential people in my life because now I get to talk for a living. And I couldn't have done that without her. Um, but at nine years old, I managed my uncle's uh, county commission race and me and Uncle Lou went riding around the neighborhood and we'd knock on doors and when they opened the door, I said, you need to vote for my uncle. Except I was, you need to vote for my uncle. And they looked at me and they're like, well, you seem pretty sure of yourself. And I said, well, yeah, because he's a pretty good dude. And then next thing you know, uh, I had to start my college a semester late because I worked on the 4000 campaign and I was down in Florida during the recount. Uh, in 2004, I was a delegate for the Democratic National Convention uh, for John Kerry and um, I also worked on a guy's campaign by the name of Phil Bredesen, uh, who's running for Senate this year and um, he's a very good guy. Uh, I ended up being strategic planning director for Department of Labor uh, from 2006 to 2010. Uh, leading a 1,600 person department. And after that, uh, managed my own uh, medical supply company. We did diabetic shoes all over the Southeast uh, in nursing homes and assisted living. So when I started, I just had Tennessee. When I left, I had a seven state territory. And in my bio, um, what I talked about was, number one, I'm Amanda Langford's husband. I thank God every day that she has horrible taste in men. <laughs> and uh, if, if I can be her worst mistake, then I've done pretty good. I'm winning in marriage. Um, she is a physical therapist at Results Physiotherapy in Hendersonville off of New Shackle Island Road. Uh, we have a two-year-old daughter. And that's actually how I ended up becoming part of Edward Jones. Uh, we tried for six and a half years to have a child, and we had some difficulties along the way. A failed adoption. And when you spend 120 nights in a hotel, um, you end up not being home on the right nights that you're supposed to be home. And uh, that got become more and more difficult. And then we did IVF, and uh, she is actually our last embryo. So uh, there's a good chance she's probably gonna be our only child. <laughs> um, but she turned two last month. And then we have a five and a half year old beagle. His name is Smokey. And uh, that's our family in a nutshell. So I ended up going to Edward Jones because I was getting so tired of the travel. And my financial advisor, who was my cousin from Paris, called me up one day and said, hey, how's business going? And then after a five minute diatribe later, he said, pull over, I need to talk to you about something. <laughs> and honest to goodness, 30 minutes later, I was going down the Edward Jones path. Um, what it has done for me is it's allowed me to sleep in my bed every night it allows me to rock my child to sleep. It allows me to eat dinner with my, with my wife. And it's allowed me to become a part of my community because the political side of me was missing that. And what I want to talk about today, if you'll look, it says, life is too short. Grudges are a waste of perfect happiness. Laugh when you can. Jim Valvano gave a great speech in the Espies in 1993, just before he passed away, and they started the Jimmy V Foundation, which is a foundation to raise money for cancer research. And what he said was, do you know what a great day is? A great day is when you can laugh, learn something, and be moved to tears. So if you can laugh, learn, and cry, You've had a pretty darn good day. And what I've learned through this is what I do is I help people plan for retirement. Uh, I help people try to accumulate wealth. I try also have to help people plan for the worst. And with that, nothing big. I'm just in charge of retirement and life savings, you know. And with that comes a certain amount of trust. 
you have to like me because you're going to be stuck with me for a while. And then also you have to know that I can do my job. Now, the whole point behind this in saying life is too short, I'll give you an example of something that happened to, in our office not long ago. You see, it's a mutual relationship. Not only does the client have to choose me, I have to choose the client. Because again, it's going to be a 15, 20, 30, maybe even a three generation career with that family. And I had somebody that we had taken on as a client, a $300,000 account, and they called our office and within five minutes called us back and they had cussed my branch office administrator twice. The first time was in warning. The second time, that was the first and thankfully only time I've had to fire a client. You see, one of the things that we work at and what we do Everyone around this table is in sales in some way, shape, or form. And by being in sales, we always think, oh no, what do I need to do to get this client? What do I need to do to get that client? What can I do? How can I bend over backwards to show them that I'm the best person for them? But did you ever think to yourself what you'd steal into you to bend over backwards for that person? To stay after hours? To do that stuff? You see, a couple weeks ago, I had someone that, honestly, he had been a family friend. His son and I were roommates in college. I had known him since he was seven years, since I was seven years old. And he emailed me about a year and a half ago, hey, I'm 58, my wife's 58, and we need somebody to help us with what we're doing for retirement. So I drove down to Paris, met with him looked at their 401ks, and I said, hey, you know, it, it, it's gonna be a penalty if you move your money now, let's wait, and we'll move it when you're 59 and a half so you don't have a penalty. And in the meantime, let me look at your 401k and see what you've got in there. Now he had $660,000 in his 401k. He had done a great job saving. And he had it all in this one fund, and I said, no, you need to move this, this, and this, and this. I did that out of the goodness of my heart because at 59 and a half, they're gonna move. Well, as a result, he got an additional $58,000 in return versus what he had been if he had stayed in that. Wow. One so I'll go down and meet with him a couple weeks ago. Show him what we're gonna do, show him all the fees, everything else, he's good to go, that's on a Monday. On Tuesday, I get an email. Hey, you know what, I'm just, I just don't know about these fees. I just don't know. And so I showed him also all the different things that we've done in return and all this stuff. On Thursday, I get an email. John, you know what, I'm just gonna do it myself. <laughs> First time I ever felt like someone stole from me. And I stewed because I didn't want to write a response right then because if I did, Let's just say there would have been other four-letter words in there than golf. <laughs> and and as we as I went over and I thought about it, I thought about it. Finally, on Sunday, after three days of being mad, you can ask my wife about that. You mm -hmm. want to make sure because I wasn't a nice person to be around. I finally just sent him an email. I said, "You know what? Uh, I understand. I've given you all this stuff, and you've taught me a very valuable lesson." You see, I gave something away that was worth thousands of dollars because I thought that we had, had a deal. And come to find out, we didn't. So in a crazy way, you taught me a very valuable business lesson. But good luck, I wish you the best. And then after that, I had to get it off my shoulders because it was dragging me down. You see, there, there's something that we talk about in what we do. You have to get so many no's in order to get a yes. Anyone ever heard that before? Do you know how many no's it is for your business? I know for me it's about 15 to 20. And that's okay. I can love it when people tell me a no. But you know what kills me? A maybe. Or a let me think about it. Or a let me talk to my wife and I'll call you back in a week. And then what happens? That week goes by. Do you get a phone call? Do you even get an email? 
And then you call them back. Surprisingly, it goes to voicemail. Hmm, how about that? Here's one of the things that I want you to do in your business. When you first meet with somebody, talk to them, tell them about your 60-second elevator speech, do all this stuff. But at the end of it, say, and oh, by the way, it's okay for you to tell me no. Are you okay with telling me no? And wait for that response. That awkward silence is going to tell you if that person is okay with telling you no. Because for me, the maybe is I'm going to bug the you-know-what out of that person until that get a yes or a no. So tell me up front it's okay to tell me no. Because then I can sleep at night because I know that I did everything that I could for that person. Now, if you'll look on the second and third page, it's just a little bit about my business. <clears throat> I have a Facebook page. Like it. We do two to three updates a week. Uh, the last thing is a list of all the stuff that we do with Edward Jones. I don't even know it all by heart. But I can tell you this. The whole point behind that is that we are much more than just a stockbroker. We are a financial